Okay, this is uh, day two in the rise of mass democracy. That should be rise of. If you remember, we had just elected John Quincy Adam in the Korean War. Uh, this is showing John Quincy Adams at about number 19. He was a great secretary, so great president. So because of that corrupt deal, um, Jackson is actually going to run and be a senator, and he starts running for president almost immediately. And Congress passes a, an increase in the tariffs. Uh, this is going to be called the Tariff of Abominations because it increases from 23% to 37%, and then they're going to raise it again. So uh, basically, this is going to be very, very unpopular. Uh, Jackson knows that this is going to be kind of a death knoll for uh, John Q. And this is going to be passed with New England support, because remember that that is usually good for manufacturing. Daniel Webster from Massachusetts supported it. And Vice President John C. Calhoun is going to be adamantly opposed to this so the South is so angry about this that um, they, they do something called the Southern Carolina Exposition. And basically, John C. Cajon, and remember he's a vice president of the United States, he meets in South Carolina and he says this tariff is unjust. He says the tariff is unconstitutional. And they say the states should nullify this act that was passed by the United States Congress. Now, these guys are going to be called nullies. Um, he really didn't want secession, but he did want the power to, to do this. No other states supported South Carolina in any, any type of secession. Uh, John Quincy's presidency, not a whole lot going on here. Uh, he was he was pretty much stymied from the very beginning just because of the, um, the way he got the presidency. And as the election of 1828 comes up, remember the, these are all spo supposedly Democratic Republicans. Um, they're going to split. So the Democrat Republicans are going to split. And the National Republicans, which are going to become the Whigs, support John Quincy Adams. And it says a mudslinging, nasty campaign. They accused John uh, Jackson's wife of bigamy. Uh, she thought she had a divorce from her first husband. And as it turns out, when she married Jackson, she was still married to the first husband. And two years later, uh, has to marry Jackson again. Well, this comes out during the uh, campaign, and John Quincy's Adams uh, supporters, they, they published that she was a bigamist and that um, uh, other, other terms for a woman who is living in sin. And she is actually going to die uh, before Jackson takes office. And Jackson blames this campaign on his wife's death. Uh, the Democrats are going to support Andrew Jackson. And Democrats are pretty slinging some mud, too, and they accuse John Quincy Adams of hiring a prostitute, actually, for one of the Russian uh, ambassadors. So now this is uh, Rachel, and she is kind of uh, uh, unhealthy. Uh, she's, got, she's got some other issues, but she ends up dying uh, about, about a month and a half, two months before Jackson takes off. This is showing showing a campaign for poster for Jackson. He was the hero of two wars. They call him the man of the people, the first uh, president from the West, uh, born in South Carolina, now living in Tennessee. A definite war hero nicknamed Old Hickory. And so they're saying, let's go against the aristocracy and elect someone like so this is uh, going to be kind of a blowout for Jackson. He wins in the Electoral College 178 to 83. He is the first president from the West and seen as a fighter for the common man. We're going to see how that actually works out. 
So he, he got support for most part of the country, and they call this the Revolution of 1828. This is, remember, they re removed restrictions for white males, and uh, pretty much all white males could vote at this point. A great many of them turned out, and we see this power shift from New England to, uh, the, to the people in the West. And this shift from those first families of Virginia and, of course, the two Adams from Massachusetts to a more uh, the common man presidency. This shows the, uh, you can see he won in even one in New York, uh, Pennsylvania, northern states. Uh, he, it was pretty much a blowout, and John Quincy Adams only really won in uh, those, those far northern states, as well as New Jersey and Delaware. So this is Andrew Jackson. Andrew Jackson had a scar that was given to him by a British officer when he was just a boy during the Revolutionary War. Um, in 1806, he fought in a duel. Um, he actually wore a great big cloak, and that was supposed to, uh, the guy who was, he was in a duel with was a very good shot, and the cloak was so large that he hoped it would kind of disguise his whole body mass. Uh, the fellow shot first, and Jackson was hit, but pretended like he wasn't. And if you remember in a duel, then he had a free shot, and he dealt the man a mortal wound. Uh, he walked off the field, and as the guy died, the guy thought he'd missed. He hadn't missed, but it, it did lodge in uh, Jackson's chest. However, it was not a mortal wound. So Jackson, uh, he's 13 here, but he is falling, and we're going to talk about some reasons that Jackson in the rankings of the presidency. Okay, so like I said, he personified the New West. Um, he he is gonna he's gonna change the way the presidency is the power of the presidency. So he wants to get rid of the aristocracy. There's no more powdered wigs. There's no more of those uh, short pants and high heels. And he is kind of going to be a state's rights guy on some things and then not necessarily on the others, but he does believe in a strong presidency. He's going to use the veto 12 times. That's more than all the other previous presidents combined. There had only been nine vetoes total before number seven, Andrew Jackson, and he is going to do that 12. He is also going to uh, refuse to honor some of the Supreme Court decisions, which we will talk because of this and because of the power that he is going to use, they are going to call him King Andrew. And you can see by this political cartoon, I will tell you, you will see this political cartoon again. So pay attention to it. He's uh, holding veto there in his hand, uh, a scepter. In the other hand, he is trampling on the Constitution of the United States. He's trampling on Clay's American plan, if you can see, that says internal improvements and the U.S. Bank, um, Bank of the United States. Remember that in tariffs, that was um, Clay's American plan. And so he's, uh, he's pretty much trampling on uh, the American ideals and, and taking over this power of the presidency. So this is kind of a theme of this um, new democracy. Uh, he, he's, he's, he's basically making presidential power a serious, serious part of that checks and balance, and in his opinion, the most important. And now the Whigs are going to uh, emerge as the second party, and it's going to be the Whigs and the Democrats for a while. And this is also significant with the Jacksonian uh, presidency, two, two new defined political Okay, so we talked about this, um, now all white males, there's no property restrictions. Instead of the political um, parties picking the candidates, they're now having a caucus, it's the end of the caucus, and they're going to have uh, uh, conventions basically to select candidates. Uh, he is going to 
kick out, he calls it rotation of office. And some of the people that have been in office have been in office since George Washington's time. Now we're looking at the seventh president of the United States. And he is going to uh, kick them out and bring in his own people. Now this is um, called the spoil system. And some of the people he brings in aren't necessarily qualified. And this spoil system will be in effect um, for quite some time. And we'll, we'll talk about that. Secretary of State Martin Van Buren is a political, actually a political genius. He's from New York State, and um, he is going to, to be very influential in the Jackson presidency. So this is called rotation of office, and basically to the winner goes the spoils. And uh, if, if you won, then you put your own people in and kick the other people out. So you're going to see some political cartoons that will be emerge because of this. Uh, this political machine, remember Tammany Hall? Okay, this is the emergence of Tammany Hall, and Martin Van Buren is a political uh, a leader and, and uh, likes those political machines. This is going to discourage some people from seeking office because it's going to be tightly controlled, and we're going to see uh, political corruption and some scandal throughout this time um, all the way up until, well, uh, sadly, all the way up until the passage of the Pendleton Act in the, in the mid-1800s. So this is showing him, uh, to the victor goes the spoils, okay? So Thomas Nast, and we'll be talking about Thomas Nast a lot. Thomas Nast, remember, goes after Tammany Hall, but he's showing um, them riding this pig, basically, with the uh, money saddle and spoil this is the spoils system and so this is kind of um, showing the the danger of the spoil system and how it is not necessarily good for the public okay this is this is another one kind of showing um, this is a devilish figure on the top and if you notice he's pulling the strings of political uh, these political figures, and again, a, a criticism of the political. So another thing that uh, Jackson put into effect, he called it his kitchen cabinet. These were buds, okay? So some of them were uh, guys he'd served with. Some of them were friends from Tennessee. And um, basically, they were folks that were not approved by Congress, but just people that he um, supposedly consulted with. And how much influence they had, that's still up for debate. This is not unconstitutional. A president can consult with um, anybody he really wants to, and it does not necessarily have to be someone in his cabinet that's been approved by Congress. Famously, Webster, uh, one of the part of the great triumvirate, remember from Massachusetts, is going to debate a South Carolina man um, they're going to be talking about the slavery issue, about uh, tariffs, and this occurs in January of 18. to this controversy. And Haney is going to defend the South and their ability to nullify their, this whole thing of states' rights. He uh, brings up the uh, Hartford Convention, if you remember, during the War of 1812, and how they started it, basically. Um, he condemns the tariff of abominations, and he says that states should have the right to nullify any federal law. This is uh, an argument that's going to continue right up until the Civil War, and Webster is going to reply. He's going to defend the Union in the Northeast. He says that no, the states do not have the right to nullify a federal law. He says the people are the most important. They frame the Constitution. This is not the, a compact theory between states and a federal government. It, the, the Constitution says, we the people of the United States. And famously, remember this quote, liberty and union, now and forever, one and inseparable. This is going to be used again by Andrew Jackson. And this basically is going to be used right up until the Civil War. Some credit Webster with helping helping uh, with this patriotism of the Civil War. Um, 
you know, some of these fellows that was preserved the union at all cost. And it kind of starts with this Webster Hanning debate. So each side, of course, thought that their guy won, but this, this is a debate that was held in Congress and is going to have long-term effects. So this was kind of a, a yearly event, and they called it Jefferson Day, and all the people in Congress would come, the president would come, kind of like they do now with um, the, the press corps, and they give toast. So Andrew Jackson, um, he's, he's giving one of the first toasts, and he says, our union, it must be preserved. Calhoun responds, remember Calhoun from South Carolina, Secretary of State, I mean, uh, uh, Vice President, says, the union next to our liberty most dear. So he throws in the liberty, liberty thing. Um, Calhoun, he is a states' rights guy, and he is our only person to have served as Vice President under two elected. Now, his wife was a big socialite, and uh, Calhoun's wife basically was very pretty, South Carolina. She threw lots of parties, and it was a very social um, time in Washington, D.C. Uh, a lady named Peggy Eaton had um, married a little bit too soon. She was a widow, and she marries, uh, this, it, she marries a Jackson Secretary of War. So when she makes this marriage, um, the wives, uh, cabinet wives, and the uh, vice president's wife snubs her. They uh, don't ask her to the parties. When she brings her card and presents it, they uh, kind of turn their backs on her, and she is distraught. Well, you know, Jackson, thinking about what happened with Rachel, uh, he is angry and, and goes to Calhoun and basically wants Calhoun to do something with his wife. Calhoun refuses, and uh, Van Buren is going to back Jackson. Calhoun is going to resign from the presidency, probably more over the tariff than Peggy Eaton. But this is an open break between Jackson and Calhoun, and Jackson uh, is, you know, he's an angry military type being obeyed. So this might be a little bit over over exaggerated. I want you to watch the video of cabinet wives and you can kind of make up your mind yourself. Okay. So probably the tariff though is the most important reason and Calhoun is going to resign the vice presidency and Van Buren will become vice president of the United States. This will result in another nullification controversy. South Carolina is fuming and uh, this is, again, that goes to Congress, remember, I'm not Congress, but to uh, the South Carolina House. And they, um, again, talk about nullification of this federal law. Now they're calling these guys nullies. And uh, they, this is really, really making jam at this point. You can see the tariff of abominations, uh, way over 60% in some cases. It was uh, the only time it's ever been higher is when Hoover tried to put into effect the Smoot Hawley tariff, and which was another disaster. It'll be resolved. Okay, it's we they lower it a little bit from 45% uh, to 35%. Southerners still don't like it, and South Carolina says nope, we're not going to pay it. It's null and void. So. They start making military preparations, and so does Jackson. Jackson says, okay, you want to be like that? And Jackson said that he would uh, collect it by, by force if necessary. So we are right on the brink of a civil war right here. Jackson's not going to back down. He even threatened to go with, in, into South Carolina and hang Calhoun. You can see here uh, the cartoon is criticizing Calhoun for his views on nullification and how this can move all the way up to treason and then to civil war. So uh, this, is, this is how important this is. You know, when we talk about tariffs, we don't think about how important this is. 
So Jackson is condemning this nullification. He threatens to hang the nullifiers. He begins military preparation. And we're right on the brink of civil war. And here comes Henry Clay, the great compromiser. So he says, okay, let's, we don't need a civil war over this. We will reduce the tariff. We'll do it over time, 10% over eight years. And New England says, I don't like it. And Calhoun says, well, I do like it, but I wish it was coming faster. But anyway, once it's going to avert a civil war. So this is his second great compromise. Remember, the first one was a Missouri compromise. Now this is so this is his second one. You can see he's aged just a little bit, uh, former war hawk and part of that great triumvirate. And now a hero again. So thank you, Henry Clay. But ja Jackson says, okay, uh, this is good, but we're going to pass the force bill. Kind of like the Declaratory Acts, remember, that the British did. Uh, they said, yeah, we're still the boss of you. And basically this says, if I need to, I will get an army and I will come and collect tariffs if I need to. And it was called the Bloody Bill by the South. And it, and, and the South Carolinians symbolically nullified. Okay, so the aftermath is, this is kind of a stepping stone to the Civil War. South Carolina is now the bad boy state instead of Rhode Island. Uh, Calhoun resigns the presidency. And... Uh, this is later, you know, now we've got two appeasement policies that have been proposed and accepted by Henry Clay. So Henry Clay gets his, his reputation as the great 